I'd like to uh, thank all of you for, for coming out for this talk and thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, I have to say I am a, a little bit nervous um, now about the quality of my figures after all those nice presentations about visualizing data this morning. And so please don't hold me to too high of a standard here. So what we're going to be talking about, um, and really the, the kind of the, the theme of this uh, workshop, is the fact that we're living in this world now where we can generate large quantities of materials data. So, so the people actually who've done the work I'm going to be talking about today, and I'll just point these out quickly. These are all students in my research group. Uh, Leon Kao has done a lot of the work on, on the cluster expansions. Um, and then Kyle McGill and Pandu Wasesa, Kyle was an undergraduate who's now a, a software developer. Um, they did a lot of work on a, a K-Point project that I'll also briefly talk about. So, so this world we're living in where we have all this material data, um, the, the question that is really should be on all, all our minds and something we work on in our group all the time is what can we do with all these data that we can generate and store? Um, so really I've, I've come up with sort of four broad categories of things that you can do and, and we do work on all these areas in my group. Uh, the first one is what everyone kind of dreams about, which is that you, you search through all these data and you um, know what properties you want for your particular application and you try to find a material in that database that has all the right properties and then you commercialize it and, and it's a great success. Uh, so, so this is you know, number one what you can do. Uh, you can also then uh, look through the data using machine learning techniques and basically do data mining to try to find, um, to try to find uh, tools and patterns that will help you as a material scientist design new materials. And this is often done using machine learning. You can also, and this is what we'll be talking about today, develop new methods. So using all the data we've generated, can we find ways to calculate properties more quickly and or more uh, accurately than we did before? And finally, you can just use it as reference data. So in all those big books we have on our shelves with uh, all the tables of data, that's all going away, right? Um, we're getting all this information now online through these databases. And so what I'm going to be talking about today are these, uh, these last two categories, and mostly focusing on this area, developing the new methods. And the method uh, that we'll be talking about is something known as the cluster expansion. So cluster expansions have traditionally been used in the field of alloy theory, or really anywhere where you can have substitutional disorder in a material. And so what, what I'm showing you here, and, and as I said, you know, please uh, you know, bear with me on the quality of these illustrations. This is a, a crystalline material. And so the blue circles represent one type of atom, the green circles represent a different type of atom. And you have, so for example, in an alloy, you might have them form a solid solution where they're, they're all mixed up on the same sort of lattice. And so if you want to try to calculate the properties of this material, you run into a problem, right? Because the atoms could be arranged this way, they could be arranged this way, they could be arranged this way, and all of those will have their own properties. And so if you think about this, we can't use something like density functional theory directly to calculate the properties of these different arrangements because there are far, simply far too many of them. It would be too expensive to do this using density functional theory. So instead what we do is we sit a, fit a simplified model to this system known as a cluster expansion. A cluster expansion is basically just a, a generalized Ising model. So what we're going to do is we're going to assign what we call site variables to each of these sites. And every site then is going to get a value. It's either going to be, so I'm going to use a simple binary example here. You can generalize this to, to ternary and higher order systems. But every site is going to get a value, either a plus one or a minus one. So here we'll give a plus one if you have a blue atom there and a minus one if you have a green atom there. And so now we have a mathematical description of the structure of our material in terms of these site variables. And so it turns out what we can do is we can express a property of this material in a basis expansion of functions of these site variables. And it will look something like this. So here I've expressed the, the energy. So this S vector, that's just the vector of all my site variables. And so what I have here are a number of different terms. These Vs are coefficients known as effective cluster uh, interactions. Right now I don't know what they are. But these terms here are the basis functions that I'm working with. And they're very simple. As I said, it's just like a generalized Ising model. So each of these basis functions corresponds to a cluster of sites, or in this uh, case, it's a group of symmetrically equivalent clusters of uh, sites. So for example, you've got a cluster that contains just a single site here. That's this term here. And the corresponding va basis function is just the product of the site variables for all the sites in that cluster. So here, it's just a single site. You could have clusters of nearest neighbor pairs, look something like that. The corresponding basis function is just the product of the sites in those nearest neighbor pairs. 
And then you can have nearest neighbor triples. You can have uh, four body clusters. You have clusters of discontinuous uh, atoms that aren't contiguous with each other. Um, basically, all of the, the clusters of sites you could possibly list out. And if you list them all out, this is an exact expansion. Uh, so as you can show up that you will have coefficients here that will exactly reproduce a material property. Now, of course, that would be an infinite sum. And in most cases, it uh, turns out for something like the energy, we can get away with truncating this uh, cluster expansion. So, so basically removing terms past a certain point, only keeping small compact clusters in the expansion uh, with little loss of accuracy. And so what we have is now a, a linear equation where we have these unknown coefficients that we need to determine. So really when we're fitting a cluster expansion, we're trying to figure out ways to figure out what these effective cluster interactions are. And once we have that, now we have some way to calculate, say, the energy of a material very rapidly. Because this is the sort of equation that computers do really well, right? Multiplying a lot of plus ones and minus ones times constants and adding them all together. This is, this is very fast on a processor. Okay, so how do we get these? How do we get these unknown coefficients? So traditionally, historically, you know, people have been using this method for, for many decades now. Um, the approach that people have used is a least squares fit. Now, the least squares fit is a fairly, fairly simple. You're probably familiar with it. The idea is you try to find the set of coefficients or the set of effective cl uh, cluster interactions that minimize the squared, the sum of the squared distances, differences between the cluster expansion predicted energies and the energies calculated, say, using density functional theory. You could use another method to calculate the energies here. People almost always use density functional theory because it's got the, the good speed accuracy trade-off. And so that will be our, our set of cluster expansion ECI. Now, if you look in the machine learning uh, literature, specifically the statistical machine learning literature, you'll find that there's generally a better way to do this than a least squares fit. Um, and it's very similar. Uh, so we have a similar expression, but we use a Bayesian approach. And so it's the exact same expression, except now we're minimizing the squared error minus the natural log. And this term here is the prior probability over the possible values for the effective cluster interactions. Um, so, so what is this term, the, the prior probability? So this is what we think the coefficients would be before we've actually generated any training data. And so the, the question is, well, how do you get that from? Isn't that you know, kind of biasing your results? Well, the interesting thing is that if you actually work through the math, this term is always there. Um, so even when you're doing a least squares fit, that term is there um, implicitly. You might just not be explicitly aware of what it is. And so this is, you know, I'll, I'll illustrate that in the, uh, the next slide here. So imagine I'm building a cluster expansion. And I decide that I'm going to include, I'm going to do a least squares fit to fit the data. And I'm going to include in the cluster expansion nearest neighbor pairs and next nearest neighbor pairs. And so when you're doing a least squares fit, the prior probability distribution you're implicitly using is that all values for the corresponding ECI here are equally likely. Basically, what's known as an improper prior, where you say every possible value is equally likely. And what you're really saying there is that the, the um, effective cluster interaction is as likely to be um, one kilo electron volt as it is one milli electron volt. Um, so it's not necessarily the most physically realistic, but, but that's mathematically what you were doing. And now say we've decided we're not going to include the third and fourth nearest neighbors, so we're going to get rid of those. And so here, the prior probability distribution you're using is a delta function centered at zero. You are saying, I am 100% confident that the uh, values for those cluster interactions are zero. And that's why they're excluded from the fit. And so the question is, can we do better than this? And, and the answer is yes. We, we can come up with more physically meaningful priors. And so let's go to a, another example. Uh, so we start off with the expression for the Bayesian approach. You may have heard of ridge regression, right? If, if you've worked in the, the field of function fitting or machine learning, it's a very common method. So ridge regression would be uh, an expression similar to this, except this minus natural log of the prior probability distribution just becomes this. It's plus lambda times the, uh, the squared magnitude of your ECI. And so this is a Bayesian approach. Um, so so it's, it's fairly straightforward to show that ridge regression is just a Bayesian approach in the format that I showed you earlier, because we can rewrite this expression. This is about as mathematical as I'll get in the talk. I apologize already for this, but um, we'll, we'll get onto some examples later on. But we can rewrite this expression here as the negative log of the exponent of negative lambda times the uh, ECI squared. And so if we compare this to the expression I showed you earlier for the Bayesian approach, it becomes apparent that this term in parentheses here, the e to the minus lambda um, v squared, is just your prior probability distribution that you're using. So when you do ridge regression, this is what your prior probability distributions for your ECI look like, something like this. They are all Gaussian, 
and they all have the same width up until the point where you've decided to truncate your cluster expansion. So now here I've included everything up to the third nearest neighbor and I've gotten rid of the fourth nearest neighbor. So that's a, a delta function. This is already better because here at least now we're saying that we expect, um, we can set an expected order of magnitude for how large we think the ECI are going to be. But it's still not ideal, right? Because what we're saying here is that we expect um, that the, the magnitude of this ECI for a nearest neighbor pair is going, to be about this, is going to be the same, really, as the uh, magnitude for this ECI, for a, a third nearest neighbor pair. Uh, and that's just not physically correct. What we actually expect is we expect that the ECI will get smaller and smaller, so the interactions will get smaller and smaller as the atoms get farther and farther apart, right? So we can incorporate that, so this is what I call a, a physically motivated prior probability distribution, and get something like this. Where for small compact clusters, we expect there will be um, larger ECI in terms of magnitude, and then as the clusters get larger and larger and the atoms get farther apart, they shrink down until eventually the width of that um, Gaussian gets so small it's effectively a delta function anyway. And so this ends up working a lot better in terms of converging your cluster expansion. Um, and so it turns out in, you know, any time you're doing machine learning, this would be my recommendation to you, there's a temptation now, and you see this a lot, to treat machine learning as a black box, uh, black box approach where we just try to fit these coefficients. If you can in any way incorporate physical knowledge in the way that we have here, you'll almost always get a better result. Um, the, trying to get the computers to learn centuries worth of, of physics and science um, is not always the best approach. So to the extent that you can teach the computers that, you'll usually get better results. Okay, so, so what are the advantages of doing this approach? So first let, let's go through and compare the, the least squares fit. So in a least squares fit, we're trying to minimize the squared error and we get a, uh, if you, you write out the math, you actually get this very nice fast fit. The ECI, it's just a linear algebra here. You have to invert this matrix. That's the most expensive part of the calculation. Um, but really, um, the size of these matrices that we use for cluster expansions, this takes place in really no time on a modern computer. It's very fast. The, uh, you need to select which clusters you include in the fit. And actually, uh, historically, a lot of the effort in cluster expansions has gone into this, trying to figure out how do we decide which clusters in, which ones out. Um, and in part because of this reason, because there's so many different combinations of clusters you can choose, um, this is vulnerable to overfitting. Um, it, it's, it's fairly easy to overfit your data when doing a least squares fit. Um, and to get around this, in practice, you need to have roughly twice as many um, clusters or structures in your training set as you have distinct ECI that you need to learn. And so I'll be talking later in this talk about nanoparticles. It turns out this gets really expensive for nanoparticles because each nanoparticle is an expensive calculation on its own. Because of their low symmetry, there are a lot of symmetrically distinct clusters. Um, so this is one of the reasons you don't see a lot of cluster expansions on nanoparticles. So with the, uh, the Bayesian approach, you have uh, something similar here. We're minimizing the squared error minus the log of the prior probability. And if you work out the math, so, so we use these, uh, these, Gaussian, uh, these Gaussian norms. You might ask, why do we use Gaussian? One of the reasons is this, is because the math works out beautifully. It's basically, once again, just linear algebra. Um, you're inverting a matrix of the same size as the one you were inverting before, so basically it takes exactly as long as a least squares fit. Um, it's no more complicated than just doing this instead of doing that. So here, we do need to figure out what the shape of the prior probability distribution is and how quickly that prior decays with the size of your cluster. Uh, so usually we use about three or four different parameters for that, but because we only really have three or four different parameters that we're, we're trying to modify here, and we use cross-validation to find the optimal size, it's robust against overfitting. And we have far fewer degrees of freedom than we do in this case in trying to figure out how we're gonna fit our cluster expansion. And so it's actually much harder to overfit your cluster expansion when you're doing it this way. And so finally, and probably from a practical point of view, not the most useful, is that we can actually now have fewer structures in our training set than we have coefficients to fit. Um, and we make use of this all the time. So you can dramatically decrease the size of the training set that you need for your cluster expansion when you're doing it this way. And so there, there's one more thing I'll, I'll talk to you about for this, this Bayesian approach, and I'll go into some examples. Um, and that's gonna be cluster extensions for surfaces. So imagine, you know, this, imagine this is my, my periodic and three dimensions material. Um, so the nice thing about this and doing a cluster expansion here is all of these sites are symmetrically equivalent, right? Um, and so I can basically group them all together and group, say, all the point clusters together, and I only have one type of point cluster in this system. When I have a surface, I break symmetry. So if I create a surface here, I've now broken the symmetry. And so now if I were to, to color the, the different sites in my material by uh, group them by their ones that are symmetrically equivalent, 
I'd get something like this. You know, all these dark red ones are symmetrically equivalent. That's the top layer of my surface. This is the second layer of my surface, the third layer, et cetera. And now I have a lot more symmetrically distinct sites in my cluster. I'm sorry, my, my material. And so what this means is that I'm going to have a lot more symmetrically distinct clusters, my cluster expansion. There are going to be more coefficients I need to fit. That becomes more computationally expensive. So we can mitigate this problem, once again, by using the Bayesian approach. Because say, you know, these two clusters, so this is a nearest neighbor pair three layers below the surface, and this is a nearest or, uh, neighbor pair four layers below the surface, or four layers from the surface. Those are symmetrically distinct in a surface. But physically, we would expect the interactions between this pair of atoms and this pair of atoms to be similar, right? In a situation where A and B want to be next to each other here, A and B are probably going to want to be next to each other here as well. And so we take advantage of this fact and we say, okay, we know that these corresponding coefficients, the ECI, are going to be different for these two clusters, but they're probably going to be close. And so we can write out here a prior probability distribution now over the difference between these two ECI. And if you work out the math doing this, you still get, as long as you use a Gaussian distribution here, an equally fast fit. Now all we've done is basically filled in this lambda matrix here, tells you what the shape of the prior is. We filled in the uh, off-diagonal matrix elements there. So it's just as inexpensive as what we were doing before. And this also increases the, uh, the speed and the efficiency of which you can generate a cluster expansion. So now I'm going to move on to, to some examples and show you guys how this works in, in real life. And so the, uh, the first one I'm going to use, uh, so cluster expansions generally, they're, they're very fast. Um, so we can evaluate millions of different structures per minute on a single processor. Um, they're very, uh, generally very accurate. So usually now, whenever we, we publish a cluster expansion, we're almost always within 5 MeV per atom estimated prediction error with respect to density to functional theory. And we use cross-validation to, to estimate that prediction error. Uh, so because of that, we can use cluster expansions to rapidly search for optimal structures, ground state structures. We can do thermodynamic sampling. And I'll give you guys some examples in the, in the you know, following slides and how you can use this method. And so I'll start with a uh, system, the, uh, the platinum nickel surface. So I'm going to start with surfaces. We're actually not going to look at any bulk materials um, today because the, uh, the methods we use are, give you most advantage for surfaces and nanoparticles. The platinum nickel alloy, uh, PT3NI in particular, has been shown to be very active for the oxygen reduction reaction, which is an important reaction in fuel cells. Um, and so people like it because it's about 10 times as active as pure platinum with reduced platinum content. Uh, so more activity, less cost, uh, but there's a lot of promise here. And so the way you can model this, it turns out if you want to measure or calculate oxygen reduction reactivity activity, you can uh, look at the absorption energy of oxygen atoms on the surface. And so you have basically here the, this nickel platinum alloy. This isn't what it really looks like. It's just a schematic with, with oxygen stuck here. And so what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to figure out the structure and the properties of the surface using a cluster expansion. We can map this problem to the cluster expansion I showed you earlier. Just, you know, all these sites that are occupied by oxygen become minus one. If you have a vacant site on the surface, it's a plus one. Anything that's platinum is a plus one, and nickel is a minus one. So once we, we've written this out, now we can just plug this into the same formalism I showed you and start calculating some properties. So for example, experimentally, people have done some really nice experiments on this. Um, people know that the layer by layer composition profile of this material looks something like this. So the outermost layer, the, the topmost layer, is pure platinum. This is at 333K. The second layer is roughly 50-50. It's not actually quite 50-50. I think it's 48-52. Then you get another platinum-rich layer. Then it basically goes to your PT3 and I composition. So if we build a cluster expansion of this material, and we use Monte Carlo sampling, or we do uh, you know, simulated annealing, and calculate what the composition profile would be based upon DFT calculations and the cluster expansion only, we get a profile that looks like this. It's nearly identical. Uh, so this is at 400K. Uh, so this is where we get the best agreement with the experiment. But even at 333K, we're very close. So here we have something there. You know, this is validation that this method, at least, is agreeing well with the experiment. But we can go farther than what they can do in experiments. Because here now, we can start looking at atom by atom what the structure of these subsurface layers is. This is something that is inaccessible experimentally. And so what people have looked at experimentally, so they uh, you know, look at the, uh, this sort of composition profile. They say, well, you have roughly 50-50 in the second layer. So on the left here, I'm showing you the a second layer for the platinum nickel uh, surface. And historically, people have basically assumed it looks something like this. Um, you have rows of platinum alternating with rows of nickel. 50-50, it kind of makes sense. And so it turns out this is relevant. Because if, if you assume that you have this as your second layer, you can calculate now the oxygen binding energy on the surface. 
So when you're trying to measure the catalytic activity of a material for the oxygen redu reduction reaction, people commonly use this with known as a, as a volcano plot. Shows the activity on the y-axis and the oxygen binding energy on the, uh, the left axis. To the left here indicates more strong oxygen binding. So platinum uh, binds oxygen too strongly. This is the optimal value. And uh, if you plug this surface into DFT and run some calculations, you'll get PT3 and I is, is right about there. And so that's where, where most people would say um, platinum nickel is a, is a catalyst for the oxygen reduction reaction. But when we run our cluster expansion, we find that the surface almost certainly does not, the subsurface layer almost certainly does not look like this. It looks like this. It is disordered. And so because it's disordered, we no longer have just a single type of active site on the surface. There is a wide variety of sites on the surface with different oxygen binding energies. Even though this is the subsurface layer, it strongly affects the, uh, the oxygen binding on the surface. And so if we plot the oxygen binding energies here, we get something that looks like this. So darker red is stronger binding, white is weaker binding, and you have an entire spread of oxygen binding energies. And the corresponding activities here, it's 400 uh, MeV difference in oxygen binding energies in the surface. That corresponds to 300, uh, three orders of magnitude in catalytic activity. And so if you really want to calculate the activity of the surface, you need to consider all of these different sites, each of which has its own activity, and average the current you get from all of those sites. And when you do that, you figure out that the, uh, the predicted current is about 7.8 times that of what pure PT would be, which is in pretty good agreement with the experimental observation that it's 10 times what pure PT is. We also get some other interesting results here. I'm not going to go into these in more, uh, more detail, but uh, one of the things that you find when you do this is that there's no such thing as the uh, thermodynamically stable surface of a PT3 Ni111 uh, surface. It depends on the relative chemical potentials of platinum and nickel, so you can have a, a widespread of different thermodynamically stable surfaces. There's no one single answer here. And finally, the last thing, this is the thing that really amazed me the most, is we found that if you hold the lattice parameter of this material constant, you hold its composition constant, you hold its outermost layer of atoms constant, we're just going to make that pure platinum, and the only thing we do is we change the uh, order of the second through fourth layers beneath the surface, we can affect the catalytic activity of this material or change it by three orders of magnitude. The subsurface disorder is actually very important in determining the activity of these materials. Okay, so I'm going to move on here to, uh, to nanoparticles. So, so here is, uh, once again, this is my, my bulk system. And so I'm going to do the same thing here for the bulk system, uh, for the nanoparticle that I did for the surface, which is I'm just going to remove everything that's not the nanoparticle from the cluster expansion. And I'm just going to do a cluster expansion of this. This is going to be, in this case, we're looking at a, a finite-sized nanoparticles of fixed size and fixed shape. And so we uh, build a cluster expansion, in this case, looking at gold palladium nanoparticles. Um, the interesting thing about a nanoparticle, the same thing with the surface, is that you break symmetry. So now these are all symmetrically distinct site, colored once again by, you know, grouped by symmetrically equivalent ones. So you have an explosion again in the number of coefficients that you have. So uh, the Bayesian approach allows you to address this because once again, we can now have fewer structures in our training set than we have total number of ECI we need to fit. We uh, can use the Bayesian prior, the same we did for a surface, to couple uh, two clusters that are, should be similar. So for example, this term might be similar to this term, even though they're symmetrically distinct. And we can do something else here. So it turns out for these nanoparticles, there are some interesting uh, finite size effects that cause you to have a non-local composition dependence in the energy. And so we take care of that by using the Bayesian approach to allow the ECI to vary as a function of composition. Um, so we basically can create ECI now as a function of the number of uh, gold or palladium atoms you have and couple the, uh, the values for nearby compositions to make sure it varies smoothly. And so when we do all of that, so this is going to be our system, it's just two nanometer gold palladium nanoparticles. So if we do all of that, we find some interesting things. So the first thing I'm going to show you is basically how many structures we need in our training set to reach a given level of accuracy. So this left graph here, this is a, a, with a, using just a least squares fit. And the way we calculated this is basically we would include this number of structures in the training set randomly. We had like, a, I think it was 161 total structures in our, in our training set. So we would include this number, leave the rest of them out, and predict the error on those. And then we repeated this randomly 10 times to figure out basically how accurate this method was. And so for the least squares fit, if I want to get within 5 MeV per atom of DFT, I need to include nearly 120 different structures in my training set. If I do just the, the regular straightforward Bayesian approach that I told you, the same one I used for PT3 and I, I only need, need about 40 structures in my training set. And if I then go further and I allow the ECI to vary with composition, I need a little over 20. 
So the, the Bayesian approach basically reduces the size of your training set in this case by roughly a factor of five. I mean, that's significant speed up in your calculations. And you see that when you go to four, three, two, et cetera. Um, and I don't go down to one here, because by now you have, you're well over 160 for these approaches. With a concentration dependent DCI, we actually get, um, with all 160 atoms uh, structures in the training set, we estimate about one MeV per atom prediction error here. And so what can you do with this? Well, one thing you can do is you can look at, say, for example, the structures both at zero case, the ground state structures, or at 300 case. So this is now, uh, you know, the probability more gray means more likely to find palladium, more uh, orange means more likely to find gold here. So we can look at these structures, and then we can do some analysis on these. So for example, these have been investigated as catalysts as well. Um, people have looked at, for example, where hydrogen binds on these. It turns out that if you want to get hydrogen to, to bind on one of these uh, surfaces, one of these big 111 facets here, you need to have at least a palladium dimer there. And so we can do things like we can calculate the number of palladium dimers here. So we see that once you get above 50% total gold in your nanoparticle, you basically killed your palladium dimers, and you're not going to get hydrogen to absorb on these anymore. And so you can do various analyses like this. OK. So now I'm going to move on. So, so one of the problems, one of the limitations with this approach is that we're assuming we have these particles of fixed size and shape, right? Now, nanoparticles, of course, don't come in just a single size and shape. They come in a variety of sizes and shapes. So we're going to uh, now model nanoparticles of uh, varying size. And one of the reasons that this is important is because if you try to do this with density functional theory, so density functional theory scales roughly as the cube of the number of electrons you have in your system. You can use some tricks to, to get that down a little bit, right? But that means that density functional theory calculations, the cost of the calculation, scales as about the ninth power of the diameter of your nanoparticle. So we can get up to like two or three nanometer nanoparticles right now, but we can't practically go much above that. And if you start talking about large nanoparticles of varying internal structure and size and shape, forget it. You can't do it with a density functional theory. So we need to use something like a cluster expansion for this. So the way we do this is we do this. So, so here I'm going to do just a simple example where we're going to say we build a cluster expansion. Once again, we're going to assume it's on a lattice. And the nanoparticle, you're either going to have positions where you have particle there. We're going to call that plus one. Well, that should be a plus one there. Or we should, we're going to have vacuum, where this is going to be minus one. And so what we do is we build up a training set of roughly two nanometer nanoparticles. And we construct our cluster expansion. And then we can use that cluster expansion to predict the properties of larger nanoparticles. And so what we see, so we, uh, the system we're going to look at here is sodium alanate. This was studied for a while as a hydrogen storage material. Um, still is studied as a hydrogen storage material. Whoops. Still is studied as a hydrogen storage material. The, uh, the reason is because you know, the, the target temperature range for hydrogen release in one of these materials is somewhere between, is somewhere in this uh, area marked by uh, the orange box here. You go too cold and you're, you're really freezing your system and, and cars don't really run at this temperature. Um, you go too hot, you start boiling off the water that's in your system. So you really want a material that stores and releases hydrogen in this target temperature range. Sodium alanate releases 3.7%, at least thermodynamically, right here. And then you get another 1.9% up here. So it's like excruciatingly close to being a, a really good hydrogen storage material. Now it turns out that experimentally you can show if you go from bulk sodium alanate down to sodium alanate nanoparticles, you get almost all of your hydrogen released. This is for 2 to 10 nanometer sodium alanate nanoparticles, almost exactly in the right temperature range. Um, so this is, this is you know, very promising and interesting. But the question is, why does this happen? Why does going to nano size help you here? And so what we did was we built a cluster expansion of sodium alanate, the same way I showed you. And now I'm showing you simulated annealing. I'm basically cooling the system down. I vaporize the particle. I go up to a ridiculously high temperature, which vaporizes the particle virtually. right? And then I cool it down, and you see the particle eventually condense into what is its equilibrium shape. And so it gets something like that. So here the blue is ALH4, the orange is sodium. And I get something like this if I use a cluster expansion. Now people have looked at this with a Wolf construction before, and this is the way that we traditionally try to figure out what particle shapes are. Uh, the challenge with a Wolf construction is you basically have to a priori guess what the low energy surfaces are. And so if you go look at what people have thought were the low energy surfaces, you, you get something like this for a Wolf construction, which is close, but there, there are some substantial differences. So one of them is the cluster expansion. We see this 116 surface show up prominently. Uh, no one had thought of that as a potential low energy surface in this material. It turns out when you throw it in the whole list of surfaces we've calculated, it has the second lowest surface energy of any surface that we've looked at for this material. So it's some prediction that came out of the cluster expansion. The cluster expansion reveals to us what the low energy surfaces are. We can then plug it back into DFT and then uh, verify those predictions. So we do this for a bunch of different materials, sodium alanate and all of its decomposition products. 
to get through here. And you get a variety of different particle shapes that come out of this. You know, the familiar type of cuboctahedral here, the cubic for sodium hydride, this kind of mess for Na3, AlH6. Um, and so if you put these all together, we can now plot a function of the energies of these particles as a function of particle size. And we get something that looks like this. And then once we have this, this basically gives us the average surface energy of these particles. We can add that into thermodynamic expressions for the free energies of the bulk systems and now construct a phase diagram of what sodium alanate and its decomposition products look like as a function of temperature and particle size. And we get something that looks like this. So when you have large particles, so this is 100 nanometers up here for the sodium alanate particle size, you see exactly what people see experimentally for the bulk material, which is that you have this two-stage decomposition product. You start off with sodium alanate, you decompose into Na3, AlH6 plus aluminum plus hydrogen, and then you decompose again to sodium hydride plus aluminum plus hydrogen. But an interesting thing happens when you shrink down your particle size, which is that this intermediate phase disappears. And the reason it turns out is because this Na3 AlH6 has a really high surface energy. And so you get to this point where you have one step decomposition from sodium alanate to sodium hydride at almost exactly the temperature in which they observed that peak experimentally. And so and people have now gone back and they've looked at this more closely and found that when they do see these nanoparticles, they don't see this intermediate phase in the decomposition. You've gone from this two-step decomposition to this one-step decomposition by changing the phase diagram of your system just by changing the particle, uh, size of your particles. All right, so let me just get an idea here. Okay. So now I'm going to move on to what you would probably imagine is the next challenge, which is can we treat something that looks like this? where we now have combined all of these. So now we're going to look at internal disorder within the nanoparticle, and we're going to allow the shape and the size of the particle to change as well. So we can do this. We have to set up, in this case, it would be a ternary cluster expansion, because we have three different possible occupancies for the sites. We have this vacancy where there's no particle. And then we have, say, you know, platinum and nickel for the, for the two different occupancies here. And the example I'm going to give you here is uh, platinum nickel nanoparticles for the oxygen reduction reaction. So uh, you know, once people found out that the PT3NI surface worked well, they wanted to make nanoparticles to maximize your surface to volume ratio. The only problem is that when you create a platinum nickel nanoparticle, the nickel tends to dissolve away in, in, in operating conditions. And so it turns out that you can dope these particles with a small amount of molybdenum. Some experimental collaborators of ours found this and significantly stabilize them. Um, but they didn't understand why. So they asked us to help them understand why. And so we built a cluster expansion of this system. Now we've actually got four things in our cluster expansion. We've got platinum, nickel, molybdenum, and vacancies. Um, to my knowledge, no one has attempted a cluster expansion like this before. And I don't think we would have been able to do it if we weren't using the Bayesian approach. And so what we get, so this is now just using the platinum and nickel in the nanoparticle. We built the uh, nanoparticles to be the uh, experimental shape and size. So this is uh, about 4.2 nanometers edge length. Um, they're octahedral nanoparticles. And if you drill down here in equilibrium, you find that it's similar to what you see in the, the bulk or the extended surface. You have this disordered second layer, and then as you go down further, you gradually get more and more ordered until you get to what you would expect to see in the PT3 and I phase diagram, which is this, uh, this well-ordered structure. So the question then, of course, becomes, well, what happens? What does molybdenum do? When I just put a small amount of molybdenum, how does that help anything? <coughs> So this is what, uh, now looking at the second layer of just a pure platinum nickel nanoparticle, this is the average occupancy um, at the temperature at which they, uh, they annealed these particles. So green is nickel, which mostly shows up along the edges here. There's no molybdenum here, and the, the blue is platinum. If I add some molybdenum to this, and this is in vacuum, I get this. The molybdenum goes to the second layer along the edges and vertices of the particles. It is strongly attracted to the edges and vertices. The reason we think this is is because molybdenum is much larger than these other atoms. And so here's where it can relieve the strain the most easily. It is low, relatively low coordinated sites. Now, of course, uh, this doesn't occur in a uh, vacuum. So if you expose this particle to oxygen, you get something that looks like this. The molybdenum disappears from the second layer. And the, the reason that happens is because it all goes up to the outermost layer. The oxygen pulls the molybdenum out to the outermost layer, and you create these MOO3 groups. And they, once again, want to be along the vertices and edges of this particle. And we think this is why molybdenum stabilizes this particle. It's drawn to the sites that are most vulnerable to dissolution. Um, and it does a couple of things to protect those sites against dissolution. One, it binds to the nearby atoms fairly strongly, so the, those atoms aren't going to dissolve. But the other thing it does, so if we're going to look here, this is what a pure platinum nickel nanoparticle would look like on the surface. The green is higher nickel content in equilibrium. The nickel wants to be at those sites as well. Remember, it's the nickel that dissolves away from these particles. 
But what happens is the molybdenum displaces it. So if you put the molybdenum here, now there's uh, very little nickel left on the surface because the sites that the nickel wanted to go to are the same sites molybdenum wants to go to. And these MOO3 groups that form basically passivate the surface um, and you get less nickel on the surface. And so, uh, so we can go a little bit further. And so it turns out we, we've investigated this more. I'm not going to go into detail now because this is, this is unpublished work. Um, so I showed you what this particle looks like in equilibrium, right? So what we would expect is to have this sort of well-ordered structure in the core of the particle in equilibrium. Um, so our collaborators have done further experiments and found that they do not see that. Um, it's what you would expect to see in a bulk phase diagram. Um, it's what we expect from our calculations. They do not see it experimentally. And so we think the reason for this is because when they synthesize this particle, it's initially disordered. You know, the, the platinum and nickel just go down wherever they want to, to go down. And because they anneal it at relatively low temperatures, they don't want the particles to agglomerate, so they can't keep this system up too much. It never, it's basically kinetically trapped in that state. And so you only really get uh, disorder and activity going on on the surface layers here. So for example, we can now use the cluster expansion in a kinetic Monte Carlo simulation. And if we do that, we find that the, uh, you know, the, the actual structure of the particle probably looks more like this. We have disorder in the middle. You, you've dissolved a lot of the nickel away from the outermost layers. It's actually the, the outermost one to three layers the nickel gets pulled away from. And you create a, a, a particle that probably looks a little bit more realistic for what they're actually seeing. OK. So now I'm going to move on. I think I have a, a little bit of time here to, uh, to talk about th this last project. This one is uh, on a slightly different topic. It's not cluster expansions, but it's kind of near and dear to my heart. So I'm going to spend a few minutes and describe it to you. And this is for, uh, for anyone who has done calculations on crystalline materials. Um, if you've done a calculation on crystalline materials, you've probably at some point had to generate and converge a k-point grid. Now, so if you haven't, I'll explain to you what I'm talking about here. So for calculating crystalline properties of materials, you often need to evaluate an integral over recipro in reciprocal space, over a unit cell in reciprocal space. So that's what I'm showing here. So this is your lattice in real space. You know, A and B are your lattice parameters. A unit cell in reciprocal space has uh, lattice parameters of 2 pi over A and 2 pi divided by B. And so we often need to evaluate an integral over this cell, and that can't be done exactly. So instead, we sample a set of points in reciprocal space. So here would be a 2 by 2 grid of points. These are known as K points. And so the cost of your calculation, how long it takes you to run your calculation, will scale with the number of K points you have in your system. Um, so you want to have fewer K points to keep your costs down. But the accuracy also goes up the more k points you have. And so that the way people have traditionally generated these grids is known as the, uh, the monk horse pack approach, where they basically just do something like this, create a regular grid, uh, you know, n by m, or uh, in this case, grid in reciprocal space. This corresponds to doing your calculation, say, a 2 by 2 cell in real space. So now say that I decided that I didn't need this many k points, that I could reduce the cost of my calculation, or speed up my calculation by using uh, fewer k points, I got to cut the number of k points I have in half. So there are two ways I could do this using the traditional monk horse pack approach. I could create a uh, cell that looks like this. This is a two by one grid, corresponds to a two by one cell in real space. Or I could do a one by two grid, corresponding to a one by two uh, cell in real space. And this is almost always what people would do. But there's another way you can do this, right? You can also create a grid that looks something like this. Um, you almost never see this occur, but this is a perfectly valid k-point grid. And it corresponds to a supercell in real space that looks like that. And it turns out this is better. Um, this will give you a more accurate integral for the number of k-points that you have. And so you can work through some math here and figure out why this is better. It turns out, um, it turns out that you, know, you can draw any supercell you can draw in real space. You can draw a corresponding k-point grid. And so the question is, how do we figure out which of these are actually better? And so at least for, for insulators and, uh, and for semiconductors, for gapped materials, you can make a pretty good argument here that basically if you write out or draw out the full lattice here for this k-point grid, the accuracy of your integral will depend on the shortest distance between the lattice points. The longer the shortest distance is, the more accurate your integral will be. So in this case, that's why this grid, where the shortest distance is the diagonal of one of these unit cells, is better than this grid where the shortest distance is just one of the edges of these unit cells. So basically, this distance, the shortest distance between the lattice points, this becomes our metric for how accurate our integral is. And so the cost is going to be the number of symmetrically uh, distinct or irreducible k points we have. And so we plot out a whole bunch of k point grids for a given material, we'd get something that looks like this. Now, it turns out that not all of these are, are equally interesting or useful, right? 
So some of these grids are, are better than others. Basically, we only care about these ones around here that kind of optimize our speed and accuracy trade-off. So this is what we know it called the Pareto frontier of k-point grids. So these are the grids for which there is no other grid that was both more accurate and faster. And so say, for example, you, you want to uh, get a, do a calculation at this level of accuracy. And so you can say, well, OK, if I'm at this level of accuracy, I probably want to use this grid here. You can always do better by finding another grid on the Pareto frontier. So in this case, the grid in the Pareto frontier that would be better is this one down here. This has fewer k points, so it'll run faster. And it has a larger distance between points on your uh, real space lattice, so it'll probably be more accurate as well. And so this is now a good recipe, right? So, so why don't we just go ahead and, and do this? And, and so the, some of these ideas that I've talked about have been known for years. Uh, Froyen came up with them, and some of them in 1989, and then Moreno and Soler went even further a few years later. And they got as far as they actually came up with, if you look at their paper, you'll see a, a table that looks like this. These are different possible k-point grids. The ones in asterisks here, that's the Pareto frontier I showed you. I don't think they use the term Pareto frontier in their paper, but that's basically what it is. And so how often do people use this technique or you know, some of these ideas? So if you look at how frequently these papers have been cited over time, um, over the last 10 years or so ago, they get cited maybe five to 10 times a year. And so how does this compare to the monk horse pack approach? And so I, I've kind of given away the punchline here by using a log scale for the, uh, the y-axis here. The monk horse pack approach is cited thousands of times each year. And why is that? Is it because this approach is better? And the answer is no. And I'll show you in a little bit. The answer is, is definitely no. The reason that the monk horse pack approach is used more than this other approach is because this is kind of a pain. No one wants to go through the, the pain of trying to look at all these possible different supercells, evaluate all different k-point grids, create the Pareto frontier, and find the one that's optimal. Right? It, it's just computationally expensive. But it turns out you can accelerate this significantly. This is just a data problem. Right? So you can pre-calculate all of these grids, put them in a database, and then in a fraction of a second, figure out which one is optimal for your calculation. And so that's what we've done. We've created a k-point grid database that has over 300,000 different optimal k-point grids in it. Um, and so if you benchmark these uh, k-points, so here's a, you know, all relative to using monk horse pack gamma-centered grids. So you find that you know, whether you're looking at gamma-centered or shifted grids, Using the grids from this database compared to more traditional monk horse pack grids roughly doubles the speed of your calculation. And so, you know, that, that seems like a nice boost, but if, if you think about it, that means that basically you're, you're cutting your computational cost in half, or equivalently, you're doubling the throughput of your calculations. And so some, uh, some other advantages to this approach, I'll just list through them uh, briefly. There's a single convergence parameter. You no longer have to worry about the n by l by m and different combinations thereof. It's just this distance between the points in your real space super lattice. You uh, don't need to install anything. We just download a, a simple bash script that, that pings our server and it returns you a grid from the database. The, uh, the same input file, once you have your material and you've figured out what the, the, that min distance parameter is for your material, you can use that same input file and that same, uh, which will generate k-point grids for slabs, surfaces, um, for supercells. It, it'll give you a good k-point grid for all of those. You don't have to manually adjust things yourselves. Um, and similarly, the choice of your primitive cell vectors doesn't change your k-point grid. Something that's always bothered me about the monk horse pack approach is that if you choose a different representation of your primitive cell using the monk horse pack approach, you change your k-point grid. You can change your answer, too. Um, that's no longer the case in this case. And so finally, the, uh, we automatically detect um, slabs, nanoparticles, um, nanowires, et cetera. And there's no registration required. You don't have to, there's no username and password. You basically download the script, and you're ready to go. Um, so you can get started pretty quickly. So if you're interested, we, we released this paper about a, a year and a half ago. Since then, we've already served out over 200,000 k-point grids. Um, if you'd like to play around with it yourself, I mean, go to the website, uh, download the tools and the input files, and, and give it a try. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll take your questions.